responsibility, the Arab leaders, the Palestinian leaders, the British, all share responsibility for the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem. But we also have part of that responsibility, and we're going to have to acknowledge it. And the Palestinians are going to have to acknowledge some of the horrific things that they have done to us in their years of fighting against us. Their terrorism and their murder of innocent Jews who were killed because they're Jews living in Israel. They will have to acknowledge that too. But first, we have to arrive at a political agreement. Part of the history that we have to learn, part of the lessons that we have to learn, is that we can't do this naively. Oslo was very naive. It was based on this idea that we can trust each other, we can build trust. We have to negotiate an agreement that I call an intelligent agreement. It has to be based on the idea that we don't trust them and they don't trust us. What does that mean? How do you negotiate an agreement where there's no trust, where there's mistrust? You first of all determine that there has to be someone who's going to determine if the parties have implemented their obligations or if they have breached them. We're going to have to have a third party monitor and verifier. This monitoring and verification mechanism is well known in international relations. All the arms control agreements between the United States and the former Soviet Union had monitoring and verification mechanisms built into them. The recent agreement between the international community, between the five permanent members of the Security Council and Germany and Iran, have a monitoring and verification mechanism built into the agreement to ensure that the Iranians are implementing what they're supposed to do. And if they do not, there are actions to be taken. In an Israeli-Palestinian negotiation, we're going to have to have a monitoring and verification mechanism that will probably be a U.S. mechanism run by a United States general, not as peacekeepers, not foreign soldiers on the land. There's no one who can protect Israel except the Israeli army. Not an American army, and not a German army, and not a French army, and no one. The only one who can protect Israel is the Israeli army. But the only way we're going to have an Israeli presence in the Palestinian state or on the Palestinian borders is through a joint Israeli-Palestinian security mechanism with oversight by an American-led monitoring mechanism. And we're going to have to stretch the implementation process over a longer period of time. We cannot take the risks to withdraw from territory and have that territory taken over by Hamas or by ISIS. We have to have firm commitments in an agreement. We have to have clear benchmarks that identify points that additional risks will be taken and until both parties fulfill their obligations under the peace treaty, we don't take additional risks. One of the key elements beyond security, and I'll end with this and open for questions and discussion, one key element of any new peace process has to be dealing with incitement and education, with creating a culture of peace. We have learned the hard way that if we're not creating a culture of peace and the culture of hatred and terrorism continues, then any other agreement that you have has no value. And that will have to be implemented and undertaken before we reach all the agreements, as part of the process, as part of the challenge. And it has to happen on both sides. Netanyahu announced in his UN speech that there is a new law in Israel which is going to be implemented. It's actually an old law, but it's been revised and it's going to be implemented where every Israeli school child, every Jewish Israeli, is going to study Arabic. The Palestinians need to do the same thing. Every Palestinian school child should study Hebrew. By the way, in Gaza, the Hamas implements that in their schools. In the schools in Gaza, they study Hebrew. But as learning the language of your enemy, not as the language of your neighbor. We are going to have to 
turned our cultural institutions into institutions that support peace building, that support cooperation, our museums, our film foundations, our theater, all these institutions that are government supervised can be institutions that create peace building. And it's going to have to be done. And the way that I propose doing it is to begin now with our Palestinian neighbors and setting up a process of if then. If you do X, we will do Y. You want something from us, we want something from you. And there are things in this exchange that we can do today. We don't have to wait for tomorrow, but we have to get back to the table. No conflict has ever ended in a peace without negotiations. I don't know how you end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict without negotiating it. There will be no imposed solution. No one can impose a solution not on us and not on the Palestinians. We won't accept it, and neither will they. It will only be through a negotiated an agreement that we will reach peace with the Palestinians. But we have to start the process. And maybe President Abbas can't do it. Maybe he can't deliver. Maybe he can't. Maybe part of the lack of legitimacy that he has on his own streets is that he has failed to deliver on the promise that he made when he was elected. He promised his people that he would end the violence, end the occupation, and deliver an independent state of Palestine. Without terrorism, without violence, and he has been against terrorism. He was against the Second Intifada. But he's also in the 11th year of a four-year term and he lacks legitimacy on his street. And maybe it will take the next generation of leaders to, to bring about a full peace agreement. But we can't wait even one day without trying. We can't afford to wait. We have to engage. We have to engage at every level, at government, at academia, at the cultural level, at the grassroots level, across the internet, with our Facebook and our Twitters. And believe me, I see how the Facebook and how the cyber space is used negatively in this conflict and in other conflicts. It's used to generate heat, hate, but it can also be used to generate peace. I know from personal experience, I've traveled all over the Arab and the Muslim world. I have never met a person in my life who when I say to them, I want to listen to you, tell me your story, tell me who you are, tell me what you think, tell me what you want, refuses to sit down and talk to me. It's easy to start a fight on the internet. It's really easy to go out there and prove I'm right and you're wrong and I want to score points. Try opening up your Facebook page to some Arab and say, hey Ahmed, hey Samira, hey Fatmi, I would really like to know who you are. Don't be suspicious at first because people don't do this. But try, take on the challenge. Being a peacemaker, being a peace builder is something that every single person can do. It's easy not to believe in peace. We have more evidence perhaps for not believing in peace than for believing in peace. But I will end with what I started. The only existential question facing the state of Israel today is whether or not we can end our control over the Palestinian people, allow them to have freedom and independence, and live in peace with them. This is our biggest challenge, and there is nothing more important. It will open up the entire region for Israel. Not huggy, fuzzy, warm peace. Everything starts with interest but relations with people develops over time. And it will take time, but it takes effort. And we, as one of the most powerful countries in the region, with the most powerful army in the region, 
one of the strongest, most innovative countries in the world. Israel is an amazing place. It really is. And we have a lot to be proud of. But we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And we can't push them away. We have to rise to the occasion and take that step and reach out. Thank you very much.